pop culture. Everything is permitted. Welcome to episode 60 of Everything is Permitted here in the Zoomscape. I'm your captain and smuggler on this hyperspace route to the Outer Rim, Julian Brown, alongside my co-host, the Man of Steel, Matt Rappert, and the Master of Puns, Brittany Tomes. How we doing? I'm doing good. My eyes have dried from watching the Clone Wars, so I think I'm good now. <laughs> so many tears. The other day I was hashtag going through it. Yeah, lots of tears for uh, the final season of that show, which we are going to be talking about in depth today. Uh, it was so freaking good. So good. Pour one out for Ahsoka and the homies. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a lot of pours, though, for all those clones, but we'll we'll get into that. <laughs> I was say, we're going to start the discussion early. I, I mean, I could do a whole episode on, on the Clone Wars, probably, but uh, we're not going to do that. Instead, uh, this week, like we just mentioned, we will review the final season, um, the lasting effect uh, that the Clone Wars has had on the Star Wars universe as a whole. And then, uh, since this is Mother's Day, happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there, whether you're a mom of kids, whether you're a mom of dogs, or whether you're a mom of sourdough starters it's mother's day so happy mother's day um what other moms are there yeah sourdough starter moms those things are alive um Mm -hmm. so happy mother's day we're going to be talking about some of our favorite moms in film television gaming pop culture you name it if there's a cool mom out there we're probably gonna talk about her i'm looking forward to it it's gonna be fun it is gonna be fun I, I i had some fun looking up some moms for this for this episode so I, I feel think, like I'm going to be overlooking some of the moms that I really like. Just yeah, probably. When, we, so when we focus and we're like, hey, let's talk about this. Then I'm like, oh, yeah, totally. I'll think about it. And then like it comes up and I'm just like, there, I know there's more moms. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Let's get into some quick announcements. Um, we're going to be recording our May Patreon free bonus pod this Tuesday. So that's going to be our kind of free Patreon preview to anybody who's maybe thought about joining our Patreon and wants to see kind of what the content's about um so that'll be myself eric and maybe a couple more guests we're going to be um we're going to be talking about call of duty warzone so uh if you want to have a listen to that you have to be on patreon it's not going to be released on any of our other podcasting platforms so um make sure that you check that out but if you are a current patron the post uh, will also show up in your special uh podcast feed so that'll be in like if you have apple podcasts it'll show up there as well um for our exclusive eip vip may bonus pod uh i'm actually going to be doing something special i've kind of been hinting at it and talking about it for the past couple of weeks uh we've been continuing along with matt's rewatch series which has been a lot of fun on our discord channel if you haven't joined our discord channel yet you should we just did mad max last night and uh i live i die i live again uh witness me such an amazing film uh i forgot how good the cinematography was for it just uh so freaking good such a fun time uh and this coming saturday is captain america the winter soldier yeah buddy um quite possibly my favorite movie of all time and uh i'm going to be recording an audio commentary for it uh as we do our rewatch and that will be the may bonus pod uh if you have an idea for our june july august bonus pods we want them so if you're in the patrons only group uh give us some ideas uh otherwise we'll just do stuff for you and you'll like it damn it um no i'm kidding we want to hear from you guys uh for sure so uh that'll be posted also uncut unedited you get what you get uh it should be a lot of fun and then um if you want to be able to hear that Brittany, how can people become eip vips and support the show well listen here kids if you want to become an eat veep like the rest of us you can either (laughs) sign up to be a two dollar a month eat veep or a five dollar a month eat veep and you get access to all of our awesome bonus content. I I don't know if you were just like hulking out or like an evangelical say, like telepaster. That... Like <laughs> it was just something fun. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. <laughs> oh my god. Oh uh, you, you want to support our show? Head to our Patreon. 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 <laughs> but anyway, our patrons are awesome and they also have access to our lovely Facebook group where we talk about all these different things they want to see on the show, bonus content they want, pretty much anything. You, you can even post memes in there if you want just to like talk to us. We're pretty cool. I remember when uh, the trailer came out for The Clone Wars, Billy Pete's went on like a tear just sharing images from it. I was like, that's what it's there for. Like, geek yep. out, get excited. 
Oh, I loved it because immediately I was just like, oh, God, she called him her other brother. (laughs) (laughs) And Uh, then. So, yes, special thanks to our patrons that currently exist. There can be more. Uh, Billy Peets, Heather Reppert, Kira Conkling, Rob Migliaccio, Michael Cox, Nikki Vizi, Matt Moore, Cabrera Wimbush, and Rob Carter. Carter, Carter, Carter. Carter. Woo! Oh, my God. You don't need, like voice or sound effects when i'm around i just do it i know it's like these buttons are almost useless when you're here but i like pushing buttons it's britney bitch (laughs) um just julian's buttons really i mean that's that's the truth um matt if people want to support our show and maybe not throw some cash because we are definitely in some hard times right now how can they do that they can do that by going to wherever they listen to everything is permitted and giving us a hopefully five star review, whether that be Apple Podcast, Podbean, or any other place. I dig it. Five star reviews are nice. A permitted five star review in that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what I was doing. Anyway, that's enough of us babbling about how you can support us. Thank you for supporting us as always. We love recording this show for you. Let's get into some rants and raves. Um, who's got one? Raise your hand. Well, Matt can't raise his hand, but Brittany's got one. Go ahead. Um, my rave is that I finally had time to play video games this weekend. So I got to play Tomb Raider. And I had obviously loved the first game, played through the second one, but never finished the second one. So I finally finished this the weekend, and then I picked up with the third game. And I know the third one's like different than the other two because it doesn't follow like the same exact beats per se but i really like it so far and hopefully i'll like it by the end but i really like the tomb raider reboot series and even though it's the end of her trilogy of like her becoming tomb raider i hope they make more games because i really love tomb raider games so i can't wait i know matt really likes those games i really liked the first one i could not get into the second one with all the different like crafting mechanics and uh all that but i know that it's a very uh critically acclaimed franchise for sure yeah i think the second game it's hard i like the first the story from the first game the best but the second game is really good playing wise right I don't know. and it had cool side stuff like the croft manor things and laura's nightmare so anyway i was just like going through it i finally got to sit down and just play video games for hours and not feel guilty about it so i'm Dude, gonna try to do that more. you've earned it yo you've earned it that's yes. what my brother said too he's like let her play she's earned it she works her butt <laughs> off and like never let her, let lets her herself play. have fun <laughs> Um, and aside from that, yeah, I've been making time for more hobbies. So I've been painting more of like my little miniatures for D&D. And I've actually had a friend who asked me to paint two things for him. So I painted a Beholder, which is a D&D creature, if you don't know. And then I also painted a Venom mini, which is for this like Marvel series. I forget what it's called. Crisis or something protocol. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it was really cool. And he really liked them. Of course, I let him know, like, I, I figured out what he was looking for and then did it. But it's pretty cool. I had like two commissions I did, so I kind of wanted to do that more. We'll have to see though. So yeah, I'm actually going to, I'm going to plug you right now. If you have miniatures that you want, Brittany is taking commissions and all you need to do is look on her. Inst- are you posting them on Instagram? Um, So far I have, I mean, I might have okay. to make like a separate, yeah, make a Instagram page and then separate Facebook for it. Maybe we'll make a couple of posts on our social media so you can see them. Um, will you take shipments from people if they send you minis? Oh, for sure. And I'll even ship them back. So like for now, I've just had people like message me on Facebook for like details and like pricing and stuff. But um, yeah, some people are interested. They have like Warhammer minis that they're trying to look through and see if they want to have me do like a specific unit or whatever. So we'll figure it out. If you are too lazy to paint your own, do make Brittany do it because she's really fucking good at it. So yeah, have tons of paints and washes. Yeah. (laughs) Contact (laughs) Brittany. How specifically detail you wanted to get. Obviously, the more detailed, it would be different pricing, but we would talk about that later. You'll talk the big bucks later, you yeah. know. As Plus, I just love doing it, so <laughs> I'm not going to be crazy like other people online that, I guess, do it professionally. But still, if you're good at something, never do it for free. Exactly. <laughs> All right, Matt, do you have a rant or a rave? Yeah, so... Um, the last couple days, uh, Microsoft actually showed off. They they call it like gameplay trailers and some yes, some no, of the X some Xbox Series X games and a game that I've been looking forward to for the longest time. And I I watched some of the trailer. I didn't get to watch all of it, but I'm so pumped for the game. Is Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines two? I am 
so freaking hype for that game like I, I don't even think it comes out until 2021 obviously didn't you write a blog review of the no that that was group? vampire that was a totally different oh, okay. game vampire Sorry. the masquerade is a totally different game series but the first one was eh but then bloodlines came out and that game was just pure awesome and it like the the first bloodlines game came out in 2004 so that's that's how long it's been since it since it came out and i mean i know a lot of people are really hyped for it as am nice. i so it's like that titanic meme it's been 85 years <laughs> I, I i do just have to correct you on one thing the the only appropriate thing to call the new xbox on our show is the xbox sex because it is the series <laughs> x and it is a always a tongue twister so i'm just you know abbreviating yeah, it like everyone else Nintendo does 64 it's the xbox 69 you know was that a thing Jesus christ or you yep. no okay i'm gonna shut up now um it was a joke yeah for i you, know Julian. yeah <laughs> thanks thanks i'm a little slow today it's been a long weekend it's okay um i'm excited matt kind of going off of what you just said i'm really excited that the new assassin's creed is going to be a next gen um launch exclusive not launch exclusive but launch title for both consoles yeah i'm excited for that too although i am not and i considered ranting about it but i kind of figured we i'd hold off i'm sure we'll probably discuss assassin's creed valhalla at some point in a future episode but the whole thing of it like this is a gameplay trailer no it's not oh no like, we could we could talk about that real quick go ahead when yeah they're cinematic yeah that they're like look i love assassin's creed i enjoy you know i enjoy all i own like every assassin's creed game pretty much and the thing is i know what an assassin's creed gameplay looks like and i know that the next gen stuff it's gonna look great it's gonna you know be incredible locations and such and such and such but don't attempt to bullshit me or anybody else and say this is gameplay footage and then like just show what are cinematic cutscenes essentially like people know can smell that bullshit oh yeah man the, the amount of tweets i saw after that and people were like you know a gameplay trailer should have gameplay in it gameplay? pretty simple right <laughs> like you know then call it like in-game footage but it's like in-game cinematics yeah like you the, yeah they put in the the small letters at the bottom captured in game <laughs> like final fantasy freaking like 10 had incredible cutscenes, but the game did not fucking look like that. Oh, so no. You can't just like give me a trailer and be like, oh, look at this cool airship flying through the sky. This looks like it was painted. Yeah. And then, like, I have fucking blocky Titus running around. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and that game was gorgeous for its time, but it's just like, shit, man, we know. We know when it's a cutscene. And Let's listen, Matt, you, you brought up a good point. Like, obviously, the graphics still are probably going to be ridiculously good, but like, show us that. There's been next to nothing about the new consoles which are supposed to be coming out in what like seven eight months uh it's time you know we need to see what these machines can do and i feel like showing us some actual gameplay from assassin's creed would have been a good thing and i guess they kind of dropped the ball on that a little bit how, how about giving us a price point for at this at for this real stage? dude how, how about a fucking pre-order link like yeah, let's go like, <laughs> like i feel like that all of the the new consoles they're literally just going to be like the next day it'll be like oh yeah it's up for pre and it'll be like a month or two out and they'll be like yep here it is go have fun and yeah and they'll just like, drop and be like just kidding get it today and we're like what the fuck <laughs> yeah man man oh man um all right i have a rant so i was watching the clone wars and i was looking at you know my awesome funko collection shameless plug me uh <laughs> and i realized that i had no ahsoka funkos and i realized that they're like really hard to get and i was like okay well i'm gonna you know do my ebay hunt thing and you know so i'm i'm, I'm on ebay and there's an ahsoka rebel swap because that's the one i want i don't want like young bitch ahsoka when she called r2 r2 um that ain't my jam <laughs> she was 14 i don't care <laughs> it was bad writing <laughs> that was like the movie right yeah well it was like yeah. the movie in like the first two seasons when she was like a teenager and it was obnoxious aka what i watched yes exactly <laughs> sorry Brittany. <laughs> sorry not no, sorry no, you're good. um so rebels ahsoka and i went on my awesome funko app and her trending value was like 44 dollars, and i'm like i'll spend 44 dollars for an ahsoka pop i'll spend more than 44 dollars for that pop but this one dude was selling her for 
a hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> That's and, ridiculous. Well, I think you know the because you know you have the buy it now feature and then the or best offer. I'm assuming he had that as his like starting. So I immediately sent him an offer, you know, because I wasn't going to lowball him at you know because he put it for one fifty. I wasn't going to lowball him for the trending price because you're never going to get it for the actual trending price. So I was like, she's trending at forty four. How about I give you sixty five? And he's like, uh. Uh, how about 83 and I'm like I would do 75 and he declined the offer and I was just like bruh 75 for a Funko I'd do that in a heartbeat (laughs) you know what I mean like like well yeah right like that's the thing like you're still getting probably like triple what you paid for it originally. <laughs> like, yeah, she's gonna like depreciate in value if he doesn't capitalize now. Well, that's the, the thing too. And hot, he, you know? so I got yeah. an alert later that he had sold it for ninety five. So there was someone out there willing to spend the money, but I was like, fuck that. Ooh, I mean, question: Was it Ahsoka the White? No, it. They didn't make an Ahsoka the White pop yet. It, it's Fulcrum okay. Ahsoka from Rebels. I love, yeah. I love referring to her as like Ahsoka the Grey and Ahsoka the White now. Oh, I straight up called her <laughs> that. that. I, I, I straight up called her that on uh, on oh. Geeks with Kids when I did the, the final episode wrap up. Uh, shameless plug real quick to our friends over at Geeks with Kids. I did guest on their show on Star Wars Day uh, to talk about not the entire season as a whole, but the final episode of uh, The Clone Wars. So if you want to hear that, you can check that out as well. Um, yeah, that's my rant. So like, don't price couch people. Like, I'm willing to barter. I'm willing to like spend a little bit of extra money, but like, come on, man. You don't, you don't know. We eBay lived in an age little. where people oh, were I know price eBay. housing toilet paper and hand I, sanitizer. Yeah, good point. Good point. People will, <laughs> the fact that they will price gouge for a fucking Star Wars fungo. Yeah, it's pretty <sighs> Humans insulting. Humans are wild. Yeah, dude. Um, so anyway, that's my rant. Uh, is that it? Does anybody have anything else before we continue along this journey? No, let's do it. No. Nope. All right, let's do it. It is time for the permitted minute the permitted minute (laughs) the permitted minute you better believe it brother (laughs) take your vitamins and i I like how i like how we're making wrestling references in like an episode that has no wrestling in it whatsoever (laughs) none i don't even watch wrestling i just like all the ridiculous voices and like people they pretend i'm the one wrestling fan on the show Oh, yeah. Macho Man Randy Savage is a, is a national treasure. All right, guys, let's get this thing going. Oh, man. <laughs> We're going to go here in five, four, three, two, one. Mr. Gator, start the clock. He's no good to me dead. The Hollywood Reporter broke the news that everyone's favorite bounty hunter, Boba Fett, will make an appearance in The Mandalorian Season 2, played by Jango Fett and clone commando actor Tamora Morrison. According to IGN, a National Treasure series is reportedly in development over at Disney+, Plus, but Nick Cage will not reply as his role. Fans have been asking for a while, and they may finally be getting their wish. A Mass Effect trilogy remaster is rumored to be in the works. Also, Red Dead Redemption 2. If you're an Xbox Game Pass holder, you can now play the critically acclaimed Red Dead 2. Apparently, they'll let anyone fight in the Mortal Kombat tournament now. Robocop will be making his franchise debut in an upcoming DLC for MK11. Another Silence of the Lambs spinoff series is on the way, as CBS has announced, Clarice, a prequel to the film (laughs) focusing on the iconic character. It will be produced by Alex Kurtzman. We did it with nine seconds to go. Well done. We've been so hit or miss lately. That was that was a good run. There wasn't a lot of news this week either. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't. What what are they going to do with Clarice? Like she was like some yokel from the country. Like, Is that really interesting to watch? Is it just going to be her FBI training day? I think it is. Yeah, exactly. It is going to be her FBI. And like, but she, when when Hannibal came out, wasn't she uh, not Hannibal? Uh, Science of the Lambs. Wasn't she really green? Yeah, she yeah. was in the and academy that like, still. That was her moment to like prove herself. And yeah. He gave that so to her this is new. unless they're going to like retcon some shit. This seems like a, a bit of a weird concept. Like it's it's a weird concept because Clarice Starling only works with Hannibal Lecter. So mm-hmm. I don't. I don't understand. Like it, I I don't know. Matt's it's confused me- and confused. Maybe maybe it's gonna be Silence of the Lambs, but just as a TV show. No, because uh, well, maybe I, I don't, don't know. know man. It's I weird. Don't know. All I know is they always do that with Silence of the Lambs. They're like, here's Silence of the Lambs. Yeah. Here's the next one that has nothing to do with <laughs> dragons, even though you think it will. 
here's Hannibal. <laughs> here's Hannibal the TV series. I don't know. Yeah, no, okay. I feel you. I, I feel you. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah. listen, like, will I watch the I pilot? Yeah, probably. Um, I didn't really put in odds and ends section, but I do briefly want to talk about the Boba Fett news. Um, mm -hmm. I remember last season we talked about him a lot because there's the idea that he's kind of in the shadows in that first episode, uh, whether that's a, that was supposed to be a tease or not. And then mm -hmm. I think everybody got the idea that he was going to be showing up on the episode where they're on Tatooine and you hear his classic spurs. Uh, you, yeah, you don't see him, but you hear them. What do we think about this news? It seems like it is true. The Hollywood Reporter is pretty uh, reputable. Uh, I'm cautiously optimistic. I don't. I, I hope that it's not a huge thing they do with him, but I think it will still be really awesome to see him on the show. Yeah, I'm also cautiously optimistic. I hope that he shows up, but I hope it's more the way that he we believe he appeared in the first season. Like he's just lingering and he's slowly encroaching in. Yeah, and maybe there'll be like one appearance or something. I hope it's not like Mando versus Boba. And like the show gets really weird. I don't know. I'd watch that though. Like if it was for a good reason, like them two kicking the shit out of each other, I would probably. Oh yeah, watch no, that. I just yeah. meant like they're not like, you know, like competitors. Oh right, and right, right. Okay, shows, like that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. But yeah, if there's an episode where they beat the crap out of each other, then like by all means, yeah, I want to see it. <laughs> I mean, I'm just hoping that it's not like a like total fan service. Just be like, hey, it's Boba Fett, awesome, isn't it? Yeah, buy our merch. I'm Boba Fett. Hope you didn't Boba forget. Oh damn! Oh uh. damn! Oh damn! <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> Mother of God. Oh man, if only Django were still around, they could have done Django Unchained. No. <laughs> <laughs> No! Oh, I had that no! one ready this time, Brittany. I mean, if we're talking about prequel retcons, this is where we're at. Hello there. Uh, um, we will see. Uh, His head just rolls into the scene. Yeah, right. right. Oh, hey, it's Chango. Oh, uh, along with Mace Windows' hand. Dude. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. I just, I just need to hold it for when we talk. I know. I know. Um, oh, stop it. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just so excited. Oh my God. Uh, I'm excited. I'm excited about the news. It seems like there's going to be a lot of cool shit in season two of the Mandalorian. Obviously the Ahsoka news. There's another rumor circulating that not only is Ahsoka going to be in it, but Sabine is going to be alongside her, which again would make perfect sense. The show is called the Mandalorian, we probably need to figure out what happened to Sabine's family uh, because yeah. this does focus around the Mandalorians themselves as well. Um, I'm so stoked to see where the series is going. Um, I love Dave Filoni. That man could do nothing wrong in my eyes. So, um, yeah, Considering how Clone Wars ends, like I think they could easily tie it into the Mandalorian. Yep, 100%. And make it make sense. Yep. They're both the best things that happened to Star Wars recently. So. Yep, and we will be getting into that a little later, but right now it is time to talk about all those awesome mamas out there. It is Mother's Day, and sci-fi, pop culture, film, television, you name it, video games, there's cool moms out there everywhere, and we are going to talk about a lot of them because I saw both of your lists before we started recording. Uh, let's get right into it. <laughs> Matt, who is the first badass mama on your pick? So I'm just going to jump around on my list just because um, obviously I'm going to have some mainstays that pretty much everybody would think of. Think of but I'm actually going to go first. Um, Angelica Houston is Morticia Adams. Oh, nice. Adams good family. choice. I, good I, choice. I love Morticia in the two Adams family movies from the 90s. Angelica Houston was awesome. And she she was like everything you'd want in a mom. Like she was like she obviously loved her family. Like mm -hmm. to like she would do anything, and she was just so utterly chill. And honestly, Angelica Houston, the way she just played the role was so perfect. And I mean, like just doing that like dark humor stuff, where like for like though I I still love the line when from the first Adams Family when she's like. She's like a oh, potassium cyanide, like fester as if we'd run out, like <laughs> yes. stuff like that. It, like, yeah, but yeah, Morticia Adams played by Angelica Houston. I know some people might go with the original TV show, but I never watched that. So mm -hmm. I, I went with the movies, you know, because as I said, I, I love, I love, I love the, the updated uh, Morticia. So that's nice. my first choice. Dude, I completely have to agree. I considered putting Morticia on my list, but I had a feeling you were going to bring her up or Julian would. So I let it go. Um, 
But dude, I love their family dynamic as weird and like morbid and quirky as they are. Like that mom, she legitimately cares about her family. Mm -hmm. The husband and wife are like what you should be as weird as they are. Like they love each other to death. Oh, unconditionally. Yeah. That's what I love. Like there's so many sitcoms where like, even if shows start out a certain way, they get to the point where it's like, Oh, husband's mad at the wife for blah, blah, blah. She's naggy. He's like this, like he's lazy. Like they don't do that. It's refreshing and different. And I'm sure their neighbors are considered normal, but they're not happy in their marriages. These guys are. So yeah. it's, it's cool. I like it. Mm-hmm. Speaking of other awesome moms and uh, moving on to your pick, Brittany. Okay. My first one is also a TV mom. This is Joyce Byers from Stranger Things. So um, Joyce is one of my favorite moms. I actually, for my mom's birthday, I got her a Funko Pop of Joyce Byers because my mom reminds me of her a lot or she reminds me of my mom a lot. Either way, it works. Um, <laughs> and she's absolutely a ride or die mom. She will straight up take on like interdimensional monsters and the government in order to protect <laughs> not only her son or sons, but like other kids and other people. Like she absolutely will not let things go. Like she does what she has to do in order to protect her family and to like do the right thing. So I love her to death. She's also like nerdy and quirky, tries to, you know, be involved in what her kids are involved in. So even though she's like, what's a dungeon and dragon, she's still supportive of Will and I love it. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go with a bit of a controversial first pick. But uh, yeah, speaking of people that will do anything for their kids, ride or die, uh, light shit on fire and kill a bunch of people, Cersei Lannister. Dude, that's fine. It makes I sense. Th- I thought about putting her. Cersei put Lannister. Technically a mom. Not only technically a mom, All she is a mom and yeah, she no. is, she, you know, she may have made some really bad decisions and is pretty much like definitely a villain and a bad guy, but most of her decisions based around keeping her children safe. Like her children Mm -hmm. were the most important thing to her end of story. Did they all end up dying? Yeah, they did. But (laughs) (laughs) But not with that, not with her, sorry, not without her trying, not without a severe lack of trying. I mean, dude, she blew up a fucking sept full of like priests and fanatics. Uh, I mean, that says it all right there had people poisoned yep she killed her daughter-in-law to keep her son safe who then killed himself because she killed her (laughs) cersei lannister ladies and gentlemen r.i.p marjorie (laughs) (laughs) fucking loved her (laughs) hashtag (laughs) hashtag not mom of the year (laughs) i would say it was a blast but not the type oh it was a blast indeed all right, uh, Matt, moving back to you. So I'm actually going to keep it in uh, Game of Thrones, and I'm going to go with the Queen of Thorns herself, Alina Tyrell. Oh, God Ooh. damn, what a pick. Tyrell's in the house. Yeah, like like Diana Rigg, obviously, like the Queen of Sass. Obviously, she is, she, she's basically she's the mother of, of Lord Tyrell and obviously the grandmother of Marjorie. And pretty much, if you wanted... A mom who had sharp wit that could like completely destroy any human being that like even attempted to mess with you like that that's that's your woman right there like she pretty much all of her scenes when she says like you know all of her snappy lines and everything and just utterly takes people apart and as well as the fact that she basically is responsible for killing Joffrey which I mean, got to give her, got to give her the cred for that. She literally sips tea and is like, tell Cersei it was me. Yep. <laughs> oh my yep. God. Such a badass moment. And do you what know what I love about out? that moment too? Is that like, even though I think, um, oh, why am I forgetting his name? I'm such an idiot. Uh, Cersei's brother. Why am I forgetting? Jamie? Him? Thank you. Jamie? Fuck. Jamie, uh, <laughs> Jamie. It's because all of his character development was erased. And so was erased. He, so. And he was erased from my mind. <laughs> um, fault uh jamie lannister like is getting frustrated by her but i think at the end when she pulls that shit like i think he smiles and is like god damn woman respect like (laughs) till the end till the end he Um, was like gotta hand it to you oh sorry wrong hand (laughs) (laughs) i'm sorry was my pun golden (laughs) oh my god just stop (laughs) it's just been so long i've had all these game of thrones puns and i haven't been able to actually like 
release them in a healthy coping way. I'm not even going to shame you because I think they're warranted in this situation. Um, Which is ironic considering the shame thing we have is from Game of Thrones. It is, but we already used Oh, no, we didn't use it yet. All right, you know what? This is a... Uh, shame me. This is a nice shame. Here comes the shame. Here comes the shame. Here comes the shame. 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 Boom. <laughs> Back to you, Brittany. Okie dokie. Uh, it's Brittany, I'm gonna... bitch. <laughs> Brittany Spears, also a good mom. Um, Is she? Right? Isn't I, she I now? Do, I, don't, I don't know if she, she is now. She went to a lot of like... She, she had to deal with a lot as like a child. Oh, she did. That's true. Raji and her parents messed her up, but she went and got help. And now she's a good mom. <laughs> she doesn't understand Pokemon, but gosh, does she help her kids with it. <laughs> um, so anyway, as far as I know, she's a good mom. I don't know. Um, moving to film. I'm probably going to steal this from Matt or you, uh, but Sarah Connor from the Terminator series. Yeah, that's a steal from me. It's just it's she's like the quintessential film mom. I don't yeah. know. You wouldn't have her on a list, you know, but anyway, um, she's just absolutely badass, you know, especially after the first movie. And you literally don't want to fuck with her unless you are a robot sent from the future. Yeah, like I wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, so protective protective mama bear. But she's awesome, and she can hold her own, and she's just one of those cool sci-fi sci-fi heroines. So, when I think of movie moms, I'm immediately like, "Well, Sarah Connor's up there." And speaking yeah. of of Cersei Lannister, Lena Headey plays Sarah Connor in the short-lived Sarah Connor Chronicles, which was a fantastic show. Um, it was, Ooh, I would say it was. Connection. I would say it was a good show. I wouldn't say it was. We it was Karen like and amazing. I loved it. We were sad when I, it I got loved canceled. it when it was on. Yeah, no, it, it was. It was. It was. It was, a, it, 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 was a, it. it was a good show. But I remember somebody pointed out the whole thing with um the the terminator that summer glau played at first when she's first introduced she seemed like she's a perfectly normal pr girl and then as soon as it's revealed she's a terminator she's like i am a terminator and like she acts like a completely like robotic thing That's listen they i'm wanted just her to pull that river tam shit, yeah but you know? you know what i'm gonna say something that may be a very unpopular opinion but i don't care summer glau is not a very good actor <laughs> like she's just not i know i know <laughs> <laughs> Shot, shots Brit fired Brit shots fired reaction. <laughs> my jaw can't open anymore oh man what she did in firefly and her performance in serenity are fine but like that's like that no, is her she really hasn't done that is her cap anything. and she hasn't done anything since i feel then. like she's just typecast as characters that are like you know mentally damaged or robotically separated from but their if humanity. you're if that's your cap and you haven't done anything since then that's like telling and i am a i am a i am a sorry i know i just it's broke fine. britney's heart it, it was just you're breaking my heart <laughs> not as shocking as both of the shows being canceled <laughs> boom <laughs> there it is <laughs> and that's all i'll say um is it back to me so sorry, Summer. <laughs> sorry, Summer, if you're listening, which you're definitely not. Um, Julian's panicking. He's trying to think of more moms. No, I'm not. I got one. You you keep interrupting okay, me. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> you, you any, anything else, Brittany? Anything? Anything? No, that was no. I, I was I was waiting for you to interrupt me again. <laughs> Love you. I'm adding humor to our show. <laughs> <laughs> um, my next pick is the Lady Jessica Atreides of Dune. Or yes. of, of, you know, the House of Trades. Uh, because she straight up goes against, like, goes up against the Bene Gesserit when they're, like, trying to, like, take control of Paul. And, like, she... It's talking about, like, space mama bear. Mm -hmm. Like, she is a badass mom. And she's, like, one of, like, you know, like, the lasting characters. And can, like, she plays the game. And she just, uh, like, the love that she has for Paul is just so unending. And, like, really has to deal with the fact that she's slowly losing her son too which makes it even harder because he's becoming you yeah. know this you know basically becoming Moadib. yeah he's becoming Moadib. he's becoming you know this kind of martyr character and you know i think by like the second or third book too like i mean she's like he's not really even paul anymore you know and she has to deal with that and you know deflect you know assassins coming from him for him and dealing with uh, the Bene Gesserit, and it's just like she's. I love the Lady Jessica, and I can't wait to see Rebecca Ferguson and how she plays the character in the new movie. I'm so excited, the Lady Jessica. I'm also excited too, especially because she's such a good actress and it's such a good character that I feel like I just hope people finally realize not only just Dune, but like how good of a character it is, yeah. Also, so 
Yep. Don't I'm know sorry. any of this. <laughs> but she's so great. She's like, fuck your prophecy. But also, I kind of fucked and made your prophecy. So it's just. She's Such done like it. she's like constantly screwed up all of the Bene Gesserit's plans, and I love it. <laughs> yeah, he's just like a generation too soon. Like it's not, yeah, yeah, not too bad. Um, they tried to assassinate him when he was like fifteen. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to see what he could do. Uh, <laughs> Matt, all the worms. <laughs> Where's my thumper? <laughs> uh. Oh God! Back to you, my There's friend. There's only like a few, a handful of fans that are gonna laugh. At, like, what we're I know, talking about. I know. Like, what the fuck is Dune? Uh, yeah, as I said, I'm just kind of like, yep, uh, I'm sure she's great. <laughs> it's like when we went on a tangent about Fringe for 15 minutes and people just yeah. listened to us. Yep. Back to you, sir. All right, so I'm going. I'm sticking with movies, and I'm gonna go with Molly Weasley from the Harry Potter film series. He's still one for me. <laughs> uh yes because i remember uh i remember seeing some of the harry potter movies with a friend of mine and the way that molly weasley was portrayed she said was exactly the way her mom acted towards me because she would she would kind of like like kind of yell at her like how you know where have you been this is oh harry hi how are you doing it's great to see you harry <laughs> and i always love that and obviously like molly weasley is a badass like the whole the basically the fight between her and Bellatrix Lestrange in the uh in Deathly Hollows 2. And I believe she says, like, you know, not my daughter, you bitch, or something like that. When yeah. she's like, Yep. It's been a while since I've seen the Harry Potter movies, but I, I always love the the Molly Weasley character. I, I haven't really read the books in, in like in, in a while. Like I think I read the first book and that was about it. But so I'm kind of more focusing on the movie portrayal. But yes, Molly Weasley, like big family loves everybody loves even like the kids who aren't her children like you know it's, they're like kind of adopted into the family and so yeah molly weasley is definitely a mom that anybody would love to have i agree there's like no arguing that yep she's amazing she is fantastic Brittany. yeah she was on my list too but now i'll skip that and i'm gonna head back to tv with everyone's favorite aunt viv AKA Vivian Banks from Fresh Prince. <laughs> nice. I feel like she's like one of the staple TV moms and just growing up and watching Fresh Prince, like she, she was cool. She was like classy, but like also knew how to really connect with Will and like really cared about her family and would do anything for her family. So like she was entertaining and fun to watch. And as much as she felt like this, like regal sort of adult, she still had these like really down to earth moments and you're just like, Oh, wow, Viv. Oh, so. <laughs> I don't know. When I think of like TV mom, she's definitely up there as like one of the tops. Yeah. So yeah, she'll do whatever it takes for family. Um, I'm gonna go with a mom that has spanned multiple TV series and uh movies all in the same universe, and that is Amanda Grayson, who is the mother of Spock and married to Sarek, the Federation ambassador or the Vulcan ambassador to Earth. Dude, like she's in the worst possible position as both a a mother and a wife married to someone who is devoted to logic, does not do displays of emotion, even though Sarek will tell you later on that he does, in fact, love Amanda, you know, and then has to raise a half Vulcan, half human son who also is has that struggle of, you know, trying to, you know, come to terms with both his human and Vulcan side. Uh, she had a really hard job and she stayed by both of their sides, um, you know, un until she passed. And then obviously Sarek remarried later to another human. Um, but Amanda, she's and she's just been played by some great actresses. Um, she was played by Jane Wyatt uh, in, in the films and I believe in um, in the series. And then uh, she was played by Winona Ryder in the mm -hmm. JJ verse. Uh, who I thought was a very good casting choice at the time, even though she didn't have a lot to do and they fucking killed her, which was stupid. Um, yeah, I liked it though. I was like, oh, is that Winona? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. And then most recently, and you know, maybe this is a hot take or a uh, shout out to Star Trek Discovery Pod, a hot freak. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
and she's been played most recently by uh, Mira Kirshner, who was uh, known uh, for her role on uh, The L Word on Showtime, and uh, she's been fantastic as um, as Amanda in that series. And has like she's had a lot to do because we, you know, we have this new relationship with her being, you know, the adopted mom to Michael Burnham, and you know, we obviously have Spock in the second season of Discovery. Uh, she's just she's a fantastic character and i'm glad that she's been fleshed out a little bit in in new trek and it makes me it makes me happy and mia kirshner is a very good actress for the role so yep amanda grayson back to you matthew so all right i'm gonna go with the most obvious choice here just i'm actually surprised she's made it this long ellen ripley played by sigourney (laughs) weaver in the aliens franchise she's on my list i put her in honorable mentions because i I figured somebody else was going to. Yeah, I was I had her on my list for a while and I was like, yeah, somebody else will probably say her first. But I already Ellen, stole Sarah. So. Ellen Ripley. I mean, you're talking like a badass mom who literally goes back into an alien nest solo by herself with two guns taped together, takes on another another famous mom, the alien queen. Yep. The alien queen. <laughs> yeah. Takes on the alien queen to you know to rescue battle you. of the badass bitches. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, pretty much. Yeah, dude. She but pretty much adopts Newt, so I I she ha- I she had a daughter mom. and actually as well, remember. So mm-hmm. but but yeah, Sigourney Weaver like pretty much set the standard for female action heroes with her portrayal of 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 Ripley and it's once again, you know, you know, if you were in trouble, like who better to come to your rescue than Ellen freaking Ripley I in mean, a mech suit and flamethrower and everything? <laughs> Hell <you're>, yeah, <laughs> you're get you're getting bullied at school. Here comes Ellen Ripley in a mech suit. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> come get away ass. from her, you bitch. <laughs> One of the <laughs> first action figures that I ever remember having was like Ellen Ripley and like the full get up. Like she came with the mech suit. And you could take her out of it, and she also had like a flamethrower, and it had like the attachable fire to it. Like it was such a cool action figure. I wish I still had it. I'll have to look in weeds and see if we have it. If you do, I will buy it one hundred percent. I know we have like one alien set, but they're like I think metal figures. Mm, yeah. I'll have to look. Yeah, the alien toys were actually really good. I'm surprised they made them because I think all of the alien films were rated R. <laughs> Um, yeah. didn't stop I, me. Yeah, right. Uh, I literally watched point. Terminator when I was like five, and I was just like obsessed with it. Um, speaking of back to you, Brittany, back to me. Well, since we went from, I guess, Ellen Ripley being the adopted mom of Newt, I'm going to move to, uh, an adopted mom of sorts. This one's in film also, but I picked Miss Honey from Matilda. So, um, if you haven't seen Matilda, Miss Honey's Matilda's teacher in the film, um, but she adopts her by the end. And she's also the person, like the only person throughout the movie who really, kind of like understands who Matilda is and actually appreciates her for who she is. And then on top of that, when she sees she has powers is even like, this is a little weird, but like, I'm cool with it. So I love it. I love the ending and I love that they both end up having like a happy life together because they're both children that didn't have happy lives. Yeah. Yeah. So she's just one of those like, I don't know, sentimental moms. I love it. All right, this this next one is someone that like I'm both surprised it wasn't like at the beginning of the segment, and I'm not talking about Princess Leia herself. I am talking about our space mom, our adopted nerd mom, Carrie Fisher. Mm-hmm. Goddamn, was she an awesome woman and was never afraid to speak her mind. Awesome mom to Billy Lord. Awesome mom to her puppy. Uh, just Carrie Fisher was an amazing human being, and uh, you know. We miss her. We we miss Princess Leia. Uh, she was just amazing. <laughs> I agree. Mm-hmm. I didn't pick her because I figured you guys would say her immediately. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I waited because I didn't want to steal it from you because I didn't actually write a proper list. But she has to be mentioned. Um, you know, there's that. Uh, that uh, someone did a great fan art of her as like a patron saint. And she's holding her puppy and just like with a middle finger. Giving and, the middle finger. Yeah. yeah I shared that. Yeah, I think I've seen yeah, that. And I shared that like, on May the 4th. Yep. <laughs> that is our space mom. You know, when you talk about her like being the adoptive mother of like the nerd community, she really is. She was so amazing with fans. Uh just not your typical celebrity, like didn't talk like a celebrity, didn't hold back. Like she was always very much like one of the people. And I, I feel that way about a lot of the Star Wars uh, a few oh, not I won't say a lot, but a few of the Star Wars actors out there like Peter Mayhew when he was still around like was was mm-hmm. always great with the fans. Um 
it was himself you know obviously the chewbacca actor um yeah so carrie fisher we miss you we love you r.i.p space mom um i think we could go around one more time matt all right so my last pick is actually gonna be a like not she she didn't have the kids but she basically adopted them because they are her family still but but i actually really enjoyed her character as aunt Cass from big hero six oh um, yes oh my god yeah like she like i always enjoyed her because honestly the way she kind of acted towards the two of them kind of rem- makes me think of what i would be like if i had to adopt like you know my nephew for ex- if something happened to my brother and his sister and my sister-in-law because I would be like trying to feel my way around, be like, I don't know how to do this parenting thing. I'm just trying to do the best I can and just be like this manic weirdo. And that's what Aunt Cass <laughs> is. But she, but like she obviously loves, you know, the like Hiro and Tadashi like a lot and wants to be the best, you know, quote mom that she can be. But obviously, like she's like has almost no idea what she's doing and she's just kind of doing the best she can. But yeah, I always love the Aunt Cass character. Nice. I'm, yeah, I agree. I love Big Hero Six, and like I, I still think it's one of the Disney's best films by far. It's really She's good. A great character. It's really good. Um, I'll pick the last person that was on my actual list, and then I'll let m- mention some honorable mentions later. Um, two of them are pretty funny. So um, since I did, I try to do three film and three TV. So my last TV mom. Um, so going off of like I talked about Fresh Prince. Um, a modern TV mom that I really enjoy is Jessica Huang from. Fresh off the boat, so it's a modern sitcom, um, yeah. and <laughs> it's just like she's a tough but fair mom, and like everything she says is just absolutely hilarious to me. So whether it's like dealing with her three kids or talking to her husband about like having to pick up the slack at home because like we're all a family, we got to work together on this. Like I feel like she's just such a good modern mom, and she strives to have like the best for her kids or like pushes them to be their best. Um, but not because she thinks that she's perfect in any way, but because she's like, she legitimately cares about them and she cares about her family and they're just trying to like make it in the world. Yeah. So she's kind of like a modern boss ass bitch. Nice. Why don't you rattle okay. off if you do have honorable mentions uh, and then we'll move on to our next segment. Honorable mentions. Mrs. Doubtfire. Yeah. <laughs> I, know, I know technically it's the no, dad. No, it's fair. But uh, Iphigenia I'll Doubtfire is amazing. So I just wrote dot dot dot. I mean, come on. Fair enough. I'll take it. I, I have um, two I also mentions have, whenever Brittany's done too. Cool. I have the mother from Psycho, aka Anthony Perkins, <laughs> dressed as a woman. What? What is? It's what is an iconic mother role. Oh my god! But it's not one that I would say like you should watch this on Mother's Day. Or maybe you know, go ahead. I don't know how your family works. Happy maybe Mother's Day, mom. This makes me think to, of you. <laughs> to be dressed up as your dead mother and call to yourself from the house. Oh my God! To have a semblance of normalcy, um, and then I have Mrs. Brisby from The Secret of Nim. Yeah, because it's an animated film, but she literally she's like a cool fantasy mom. She's very much like, you know, Joyce Byers is like her. She just like goes into it, does what she has to do to protect her kids, and isn't afraid to take on really crazy stuff for a mouse. Yeah, no, I'll give you that one definitely. Nice, and that's my I, list. My my two honorable mentions. I'm just gonna say real quick, uh, Marge Simpson. And, yes. you know, after dealing with Homer and her kids for as long <laughs> as she has, you know, and my second honorable mention is going to be Elastigirl from the Incredibles movies. So, yeah. Nice. I, Very good. Um, my last one is I'm going to bring it full circle back to Game of Thrones. Daenerys of the House Targaryen, the first of her name, the Unburnt, Queen of the Andals. Reuner of the First Men, Queen of Marine, Khaleesi of the Great Grass Sea, Protector of the Realm, Lady Regent of the Seven Kingdoms, Breaker of Chains, and Mother of Dragons. And completely <laughs> butchered perfect. character arc. Fuck you, D.B. Weiss, and other Ben Off jackass for killing an amazing character. You assholes. The and things- what a good segue to now we're going to go to an amazing ending in Star Wars. For fucking that- real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah right like in an age of where other star wars and game of thrones and everything else has let us down one thing hasn't and that is the clone wars all hail supreme leader dave filoni <laughs> and the clone supreme wars leader. did 
Yes, Matt. You know, I was actually gonna I was gonna do my little Yoda voice uh, to begin the segment, but you you took it from me. So <laughs> fair enough. I'll, I'll do it anyway. Ended. The Clone Wars have. Hmm. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that was my sketchy. Mm. Always, always, and forever. Uh, this is our Clone Wars final season review. Um, if you're wondering why we've waited this long, we waited for the simple reason so we could binge the whole thing and review it as a whole instead of week to week. We did it with Picard, and that was painful. Um, luckily, this season <laughs> of television was some of the best TV, and I don't care if it's a cartoon or not, some of the best television that I have watched in a good year or so next to The Mandalorian. It was extremely satisfying to watch and an extremely satisfying ending. I was... I had I literally didn't even have any complaints. I was like, this is what I wanted. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Uh I I've I've seen your reactions watching the whole thing uh on I think you did you watch it on Star Wars Day or you watched it a little after Star Wars Day, I think. You're talking to me? Yeah. Um, I don't remember what day specifically, but it was definitely around there, if not Star yeah. Wars Day. Um but I cried so much within the last four episodes of the show that like my t-shirt was soaked like yeah. right here on my neckline <laughs> and i was next to my brother and every time i kept calling things before they'd happen don't worry i'm not spoiling but i would like lean over to him and be like and, and like just be crying and like laying my head on his leg and then like sit back up and then keep watching and he was like Are you okay <laughs> I was, um, like, it's just so beautiful I mean, it really was, and I and I will say real quick, this is a full spoiler review, so that was kind of your last warning. We are going to mm -hmm. reveal everything that happened in these. I mean, really, like the whole season was good, but it's really all about the final four episodes. Yeah, the last four of, episodes are what what makes of it a good season. the show. And then Matt, um, I know that you just finished watching it last night. And really, get your initial reactions. Obviously, we'll get into them, but uh, you started the last segment, so we will start with Brittany. Why don't you kind of continue on your thoughts? We'll kind of go. Uh, this is what we're gonna do. I didn't write it, really write it down this way, but we'll kind of go four, four, and four. So let's start with the Bad Batch, and uh, you know with i think it's with rex and cody and them possibly mm -hmm. looking for their fallen comrade uh what were your thoughts for on this four Echo? episode arc yeah okay um i liked how the show began i mean i don't know if that was exactly like the beginning beginning but the main episode point um because this show really an amazing thing about it is the fact that you have the clones that have personalities that's something that was largely missed in the prequel films and they expanded on it in the various iterations of the Clone Wars that they either had in the animated show, like the original hand-drawn one, or in this one, which was the subsequent animated series, um, is that each of the clones, even the regs, like the regular ones, have distinct personalities. And it's just like a testament to, I believe D, D. Bradley Baker does the voice of all the clones, correct? Yes. This is one man who's able to believably play all these, like just... A, a, unimaginable amount of clones really and he gives them all these distinct personalities so having that the batch the 99 like the bad batch which is named after that one clone that you know number 99 that was considered like yeah not normal yeah um it's like a really good tie back to the earlier seasons of the show and also to show that like all these clones as much as they've been bred for battle and war like they have these distinct personalities and they all care about each other as brothers, regardless of how useful they say you are or not. Yeah. So to have them join the team in search for a clone who they think might be alive behind enemy lines and has been used um, to kind of like work against the Republic behind their backs. It's such a big deal because they brought it up in the show multiple times how it's like, well, why are we important to say we're just clones? And that just hits the nail on the head. It's like, no, this is not just a clone. This is my brother. His name is Echo. I think he's still alive. We thought he was dead. I'm going to get him no matter what. Yeah. And like right away, I was just like, I am messed up. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. like I, I loved it. I mean, I won't say that necessarily the, the 99 batch is like my favorite clones. Right. You know, obviously you get more connected to Rex and his team yeah. throughout the series, especially because they, you know, have more screen time and a little more plot. But I did like, that that reference and this like group that joined them because they re they realized that they're needed and it's important. Yeah, Matt, how about you though? The, that first uh, four episode arc with the Bad Batch and finding Echo. Um, I liked it. Uh, I'm not gonna say I I loved it as much as Brittany. I mean, don't get me wrong. I loved this entire season. 
you know, it was it was a fantastic watch. I do think that the um, those first four episodes are probably the weakest of the season, and that's that's not a like a huge negative on my part. It's just kind of like me being my little nitpicky self. Um, to speak to, now, I'll be the first to admit I haven't been able to watch all of the Clone Wars seasons up leading up to this. I've only I've only seen like episodes here or there, so I'm not as attached to the clones characters and it did and i understand it's star wars and so on and so forth but i do it did get a little ridiculous with like how easy they were able to dispatch droids and it got it very much came to me as like why are these things even a threat to the characters if they're like literally one shot he's gonna bounce it among like a dozen things in a hallway for example and kill like three dozen rope droids and such like that i'm just like why are these things even a threat to them and that kind of killed the tension a little bit for me. Um, I did like the idea of like there being clones that just didn't quite work as well as the other ones did. And they're just kind of like, all right, these special, the very special forces, so to speak, you know, we're going to make them. And, and as I said, I like the Bad Batch themselves. I, I like them. The one I wasn't a fan of was the really strong one because I hated him. So, yeah, nobody so, was a fan of him. He got so one note and I was like, and then like, he's like, he's super strong. And I'm like, come on, man. Like this is I like, once again, I know it's the Star Wars universe and there's magical space wizards, but this dude like lifting up things that are like tons upon tons like you know that way like how much all this weight and everything like that that's where i was kind of like all right this is a little too much well and and that was the problem with the bad batch is like every single other member of clone squad 99 was believable like you could believe that their defect was something that like you know the republic could use in like special ops but just like super hulk clone guy with you know, brute voice number one was just so stupid and uh, blow stuff like, up. yeah, like you said, one note. I, I I think I actually the only moment I liked with him was at the end when Anakin gives him the the trigger and he gets the blow up. And he's like, "This is the happiest day of my life," and I was like, "Okay, that's kind of funny." Yeah. Um, but that was it. I did not I did not like him either. Yeah, um, he was just kind of the stereotypical, yeah, stereotypical strong guy that every like superhero group needs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and yeah. didn't get a lot of character moment. Um, for me and, and I watched, I, I literally, I started these on nine at 9 PM on, on May 3rd and finished it literally as I was finishing episode 11, the final episode became available on May the 4th. Um, so for me, it worked great because these first four episodes of the bad batch served as kind of like, okay, things are going to get really serious in these final four episodes. So here's like kind of these like lighthearted moments that you're used to with the clones, but um, they still managed to do it with like some really great arcs. Like, I absolutely love that these episodes portray that Rex and Anakin aren't just friends. They were brothers in arms. Like they, you know, they probably considered themselves brother brothers. And Anakin, you know, had done you know a lot for Rex, and Rex had done a lot for Anakin. And I think it was kind of time for Anakin to return a favor for Rex. And you know he does it wholeheartedly, even though you know they think Rex's plan might be a little crazy, and that Echo is probably dead. But you know, it's a trap. you yeah, you are my friend. I owe you. You've earned it. Like let's go. And I love mm-hmm. their dynamic, especially in these final few episodes. It was just so cool. And then. You know, like at the end of the day, do I care about them finding Echo? I, no, like I think it's a little ridiculous that he was still alive and that they were kind of using him in this way. At the same time, I guess it's a good plot point. Um, I think it would have been a little bit more dramatic had like Echo died, uh, you know, at the mm-hmm. end. But it, it's kind of cool that he gets to go and join the Bad Batch. Having said that, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I agree with Matt about the action. There were definitely some some ridiculous parts, but I just thought it was fun because we know that, you know, business was going to pick up you know, later on as Ahsoka comes back and we get into the the parts of the series that is, you know, going alongside Revenge of the Sith. So uh, let- still a good episode, just not good compared to the last four. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, like, no, the, no, yeah, no, no, no. for sure. And then um, we have the the middle of the season, which focuses on Ahsoka's journey of, you know, leaving the order and trying to find her way, not as a Jedi anymore. And she comes across, I believe, that's Trace Martez. They were the Martez sisters. Yeah, Martez. Yep. And uh, I'll just start off by saying I was not a fan of these episodes. 
I was not a fan of the Martez sisters. I, I love obviously having Ahsoka back. Um, I just, I don't know. I, I thought they could have done a thousand different things to show Ahsoka's journey. And this wasn't them. Like I, f I felt like the Marta sisters were both very much like a poor man's Han Solo. I, I actually like the episode, these episodes, because they kind of showed that the underclass of people on Coruscant, as they, you know, the reveal that basically their parents were killed from a fight between, you know, the Jedi and and I forget what character they talked about. Uh, and, Jabba's, um, what you call it? His I, brother, I, right? Or I something? don't, I don't, I don't remember the character's name, but. Basically, I like that reveal because it did the one of the things that I know a lot of people are like, why would people believe that like in, in uh, episode three, like why would people believe the Jedi would like us try and assassinate the chancellor? And it's like these the common people are like, they don't help us. They don't they don't do anything for us. Like they're basically off like fighting a war and doing this and all that stuff like that. And like these people suffer the consequences of what the Jedi are doing. And the Jedi, you know, literally, as as the, as uh, Rafa said, she goes, oh, you know, it's like the force wills it and stuff like that. And like, it's basically the equivalent of like telling a mur like somebody whose family member was murdered, like, oh, sorry, it's God wants to happen. So have a good one, man. And then just walking off. And yeah. Mm -hmm. And as I said, like, to me, that was a really good way to show. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say they were perfect episodes. And like Julie and I kind of was a little bit like the characters were a little stereotypical, but I did like these episodes better than the Bad Batch ones. Yeah, I also agree. I did like this small story arc better than the beginning of the series, um, but more so because I think I really enjoyed the way that they were focusing on how Ahsoka is dealing with this conflicting ideology between war and peace, which she obviously leaves the Jedi Order because of events that happened in the previous season, but she realizes that they're very hypocritical. And since she was brought in as a Padawan, as much as she's supposed to be trained to be a Jedi and to believe these things about peace and the way that they're supposed to help people, she's only been used as a soldier the whole way. And she even talks about that. Mm -hmm. So the fact that she leaves and then she, you know, has that trouble with her speeder or bike and uh, needs the help of these people who are just, you know, getting by doing these, you know, somewhat illegal things, but trying to have a good life. She realizes that, like, she's not wrong for the reasons that she doubted the Jedi and left. And that she's, like, trying so hard to be the Jedi that she wants to be. And not just one that the Council would have her be. Right. Because as much as the Jedi Council is supposed to have everyone's best interests at heart, they stopped doing that once they started focusing so hard on being a republic that's supposed to help the people. They weren't really helping the people. They're helping different parties that are struggling for power. And that's the same of any government. Like, just look at the world. But I really liked it because, like Matt said, we see um, Trace and, and Rafa, they talk about an event that happens with the Jedi fighting Zero. I'm pretty sure that was it, right? Yep, Zero? I, think, yeah. I think that was it, yeah. And then... They have to make a decision, literally, if the people are going to die on this platform or if they're going to crash a ship through this like portal barrier. And when they do so, they end up killing their parents on the other side because that's where their house is. So Ahsoka hears that and like she's so distraught because she knows that the Jedi aren't supposed to do that. But she understands why the Jedi did because they had to outweigh this number right. of people's lives and potentially this. And it just... I, I felt like that really solidified her character and her beliefs because she sees it firsthand and she's so heartbroken about their story um and then she ultimately wants to help them she doesn't want them to be these like smugglers anymore the poor man's han solo is basically mm -hmm. every character in star wars that doesn't have the force really right think about it no i know so, what you mean. as stereotypical as it is um i think it it helped ahsoka and that's what matters yeah and and, and that's actually a, a great point Brittany. Brittany, and i talk about it in my article like even though i didn't like the characters i i realized that these four episodes were you know about Ahsoka's journey to getting back to Anakin and getting back to the clones and, you know, to the siege of Mandalore. And that's the route that they picked. I wish that they had done this earlier in the show. Not, I'm not talking about the season, like in previous seasons, because that would have solidified more that by the end of revenge of the Sith, not to say that order 66 was a good thing, but the Jedi were not the keepers of the peace that they were known to be like they had fallen from grace. Um, and I wish mm -hmm. that, uh, some more episodes and uh, seasons had had covered that a little bit more. I felt like it was a little rushed here, and I thought yeah. that there's like the writing for Rafa and Trace 
was just like, okay, we're smugglers, and uh, Rafa, I'm the I'm the typical like I'm way in over my head smuggler, and I think that they could have done something else. Like I liked Trace, but I just thought that Rafa was so just like Han, like I have a bounty and I owe all these people money, and uh, mm-hmm. I thought it was I thought it was cool though that uh, Bo Katan was tracking Ahsoka. And, yeah. you know, like watching her movie. I really that. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's my girl, Katie Sackhoff. Mm-hmm. Katie Sackhoff. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, to be fair, though, I think they went so hard one direction with Rafa because they had to counter Ahsoka being so far on the opposite side. Right. So that it showed Trace was in the middle trying to make a decision between the two, but showing that sometimes you can't. That's fair. neither side is right. Yeah. You know? And I mean, that's a really heavy handed way of doing it by like literally having polar opposites. But right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Rafa's by far not even my favorite character from the show, so I get it. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and I didn't like the what were they called the bad guys the the Pikes. Yeah, I, the Pikes. I thought yeah. that their their uh, their like style was like the animation was just weird, like with their tiny eye, like I don't know, like they weren't believable bad guys. They they seemed like they would be more appropriate as like comic relief, but they were like badass warriors and evil smugglers. I don't know. Um, I do. Well, you know, sometimes you can't choose how a species looks, Julian. I know. <laughs> Sorry, think that was very xenophobic of me. Oh. <laughs> no, I didn't mean it like that. I, I just mean like I, think. What if you were from another planet? And you landed and you saw humans. Yeah, true. Um, I do you make no sense. I do. Uh, I do appreciate that we got a quick little uh, cameo of Kessel, and like yeah. the the Kessel run. I thought that was cool, uh, for sure. Uh, Definitely th- tied into Solo well. Yeah. So yeah, it's like it helps connect the universe really well. This whole yeah. season helped connect the Star Indeed. Wars universe as a whole. It almost right? fixed problems. Yeah. Um, and then let's just talk about the final episode of this at four episode arc, because we get Bo-Katan who tells her like Maul is on Mandalore. We need to take Mandalore back from him and the corrupt guy that Maul is basically controlling. And and uh, I think they're called Death Squad or death uh, yeah death squad yeah well death death squad was i thought she said it was destroyed right because that was the Mandalorian. oh yeah, death squad but group. maul had basically taken mm-hmm. death squad and like oh, yeah, turned he made them, his own. yeah uh so he made his darth squad and he was basically asking and i don't think bo katan quite knew that ahsoka wasn't a jedi anymore or part of the order anymore so which makes it a little bit more awkward when you know ahsoka mm-hmm. has to you know ask for help go back get help mm. uh and then we come in to the final four episodes of the clone wars, which again, I will say is just some of the best television ever. It was also gorgeously animated this season. I don't know if they just had more funding for once, but like it was either that or the animators just gave their heart and soul into everything. Cause like the battles were amazing. I, th- I think they, had, I think they had more, more funding and I'll, I'll say mm-hmm. it right now. One of my, like one of my most favorite things, cause I actually almost took a screenshot of it just to have it is the scene when Ahsoka meets Maul in the throne room of oh, Man Oh, yeah, definitely. When That's they're gorgeous. Just, yeah, like that whole thing with the glass and the battle in the background. Like, I was like, as soon as I saw it, I was like, this is awesome looking. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, let's talk about it. These last four episodes, uh, Old Friends Not Forgotten, Phantom Apprentice, Shattered, and Victory and Death. Uh, oh, my God. I get goosebumps mm-hmm. just thinking about it. Dude, Shattered, literally the title made me cry. Yes. Before we even got in the episode, I was I had to pause it and I was like, oh my God. Yeah. So. Um, I think that they handled, even though that it was a very quick reunion, I think they handled the reunion between Anakin, Anakin and Ahsoka beautifully. I think it was perfect. It, 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 the fact that it was short actually makes it that much more... Uh, like tragic? Yeah, exactly. Thank you. You took the word right out of my mouth. It it's is like tragic because she probably could have saved him you know i know oh my god that's um, the worst part about the show yeah and and we'll get we'll get to that but you know ahsoka goes she asks them for help and obi-wan is like well no you're not really in the grand army of the republic anymore and meanwhile like anakin's gone through all this trouble like the clones are still calling ahsoka commander and they have her head paint mm-hmm. on their helmets and i cried oh my god dude i did too uh <laughs> uh Brittany, go into uh, it uh okay. old friends not forgotten so um, this is the one where she reunites with Anakin, yeah. correct? Okay, so when she comes back and they have that reunion scene, like, you can just feel the love that these two characters have for each other with the whole, like, master and apprentice idea, but also the fact that they're friends. And she 
even says earlier in the series when she talks about knowing how to fight, she's like, oh, my older brother yep. taught me. So like, you literally feel like this is a brother and his younger sister. And she's grown so much even in just leaving and having to come back. And yeah, there's that tension between them. But they say a lot in the very small dialogue they have. Like they, a lot of what they say is in their like physical actions. And uh, like, props again to the that, animators because yeah. they killed it with all like they did kill it oh the subtle yeah. like just emotions behind their eyes the fact that like she has so much they have so much they they could say to each other or they need to but like things are pressing they don't have time so he gives her her lightsabers <laughs> oh my god and it's just like ugh, like she knows he cares about him so much and as much as she doesn't want to be part of the jedi order um, she does take them because she needs them and she's going to use them to be the jedi that she believes she has to be and let's not forget like they're a part of who you are, Jedi they or not are. anymore, yeah. you know? And she has the fact that she has like the longer lightsaber and then the shorter one for her fighting style. Like even Shoto. earlier in the show, when she only had one, she would change her grip and fight a different way. So like it's the fact that he knows her so well and he makes these again for her. And I think even if she wouldn't have accepted them, like used them, he would have been fine with it because he made them for her, you know? Well and it's so telling because then the the parallels later in the season. Those were her end, those were her her old lightsabers, but he yeah. he did the he typical Anakin move, and he made them blue for he his color. Blue, yeah, I was like, oh, oh, Anakin, oh my god. Um, so yeah, then she takes those, but yeah, Matt, uh, as someone who who hadn't watched the series as much as uh, Brittany and I have, how was this for you? The the reunion and this episode. So I I obviously enjoyed it. Um, I was a little taken out of it by the. Anakin's voice I thought it was a little too deep but whatever that's a minor nitpick on my part um, but otherwise yeah I, I really enjoyed their meeting up and everything I in, like there was a lot unsaid with just the looks and stuff like that as you know as was mentioned the animation was was superb and the funny thing and I'll just say it right now about these four episodes is you could have made like a movie out of these episodes and I would have been totally in like it's mm -hmm. so way it just done. to interrupt you real quick Sam Witwer uh who's the voice of Maul in uh Clone Wars Rebels uh has said that these four episodes are meant to be watched as a film so you're you you're, you're right on the, the head yeah you can yeah, yeah yep. definitely sorry continue yeah but I I I, en I enjoyed the episode. Uh, like it it was a it was a continuation of kind of Ahsoka's arc. And even though I'm kind of getting into later episodes, I will say that one thing that the these episodes did was the tension that was building. Because you know, once once I realized where they were in relation to what was happening in the movies, yeah, when you knew Order sixty six was coming. I was like, oh my god, yeah, because, dude. Like the tension that the mm -hmm. way they built the tension of that. Because you know it's coming. You know my hair something. is literally standing up, <laughs> like right now as yeah, I'm talking. Me too. Like you know, you know something. Is, what's going to happen? You know that that the clones are obviously going to turn on them. But at the same time, you're just like, I really want this to like end well for them. But you know, it's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know? it's that dramatic irony where the audience knows what happens, but the characters don't. Mm -hmm. And the fact that Rex even says like these clones clones only know loyalty yeah and they all have the painted helmets for her and everything and you know you know the way they point out in the show you're like order 66 is coming i just start crying immediately yeah i was like they're gonna literally try to kill her with her face painted on their helmets yeah um this episode did something else for me too i don't know if it was this episode or the next one um they're, they're, they again they move along as a movie so well instead of actual episodes but this also showed me how far gone the jedi were and how focused the Republic were on ending the war that like they would not help Mandalore anymore. They basically had to like separate the 501st to do it. And only mm -hmm. because Anakin had to convince Obi-Wan, you know, when everything was over and we're kind of moving on to the next episode and Mace Windu is on the comms literally like right before he goes to arrest Palpatine and is like this information's only for Jedi, not citizens. And I was just like, you motherfucker, you really are a villain. Like, mm -hmm. it solidified how far gone the Jedi were. And uh, yeah, going back to, and Matt, I know that the voice is different for you for Anakin because you're not used to it, but anybody that you talk to will tell you that Matt Lanter is the voice and he is Anakin Skywalker, not uh, Hayden Christensen. He I agree. did such an amazing job coming back to the role. And, uh, 
God, just everything, everything with Ahsoka, as little was said, was just uh, so heartbreaking because you know what was about to happen when they go and run off to rescue uh, Palpatine from Grievous. Let's let's mm-hmm. move on to Phantom Apprentice and the Siege of Mandalore, which is some of oh, like man. the coolest shit I've ever seen. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go right into the the lightsaber fight because I want to talk about the fact that Dave Filoni, the genius that he is did the most genius move and finally had Ray Park come back to mocap mall for this fight scene. You can tell. Yep. Immediately when the fight begins and he does that shoulder thing, I was like, that's Ray Park. And then like, he just goes and goes and goes. Oh. And and seeing <laughs> Ray Park in the, in the documentary bit that they did, Ray Park and Sam Witwer reacting to like his voice and Ray Park's movements. And this like this beautiful melody of bringing them together was just like Brittany, like, we're talking about getting goosebumps like this whole time dude um it's yeah, it's, it's star darth wars maul. at its finest this is the best darth maul that's ever happened like thank you clone wars because we wouldn't have this and we need that yeah Ugh. um i want to talk about and and just say also i think that this lightsaber fight between maul and ahsoka was better than any lightsaber battle in the entire sequel trilogy i think i'll have to agree yeah i'll agree with that as well yeah it was so it's fucking even fantastic. Than episode one, and Darth I Maul fight. don't like a lot of the animated lightsaber fights because they just don't seem real. They were mm-hmm. so smart to do mocap for this and get someone who wasn't Ashley Eckstein, but someone who could fight how Dave Filoni envisioned Ahsoka if she was live action fighting mm-hmm. and really embody her. And I thought that was fantastic as well. Yeah, the moves were really good, like from a martial artist standpoint or an ex martial artist standpoint. Like you can tell that Ray Park is playing himself. He does that like stereotypical bow staff move where he jumps in the air, does the knee thing. Well, the like, knee thing and then just time. like like the in the air and he's kind of like bicycle kicking while also That's doing I mean. like yeah, yeah like the boom boom with the lightsabers. I was like oh, mm-hmm. oh. yeah. Um, but like the one thing I really love about this episode, it's called the Fan Apprentice, but it's the fact that like they both mirror each other, Ahsoka and Maul, are mirror characters. They're both like the hidden apprentices of other characters you know like they are the phantom apprentices and it's the fact that they both have turned away from their sides in a way they were betrayed by their sides um which is funny right because maul still has such a deep connection to the force yeah like he believes in it and that's the thing ahsoka believes in the force she believes in the things she was taught just not the jedi council's mindset anymore and it's the same with maul he's pro dark side he believes in the force but he doesn't care about what Palpatine wants anymore. When he realizes what the plan was or he can feel it coming, he's like, I was kept out of the loop. Same thing for her. Yeah. So that whole like dialogue they have before the fight even begins, I was just like, oh my God, the parallels. Oh my God, who wrote this? This is amazing. <laughs> Matt, how about, yeah. Gorgeous. Oh, just fantastic. Um, Matt, how about you? So, yeah, I I loved uh, Maul's portrayal. Like I loved Maul in Rebels and I, once again, like I really dug his performance because that that was uh, that's honestly one of the most criminal things about the prequels is obviously them killing Maul too early and like him having like pretty much no character whatsoever and if there's one thing you can say about the about the clone wars and rebels and stuff like that is all of all of the stuff has taken Maul and turned him into a fully realized character that makes me like almost angry that yeah. he was just kind of tossed aside mm-hmm. in the prequel trilogy and you know and and as Brittany said like the the reve- like the whole thing the dynamic between him and ahsoka where he's like like oh we're both just tools of bigger powers yes and all that so i i liked that and as i said i you know with i i loved the the throne room showdown between her and maul like I mean, I, as I said, I, I might I might go I might go just pull the episode back up on my computer and just take a screenshot just to have it. Try it because I couldn't. Uh, I tried on four different devices. There's some kind of block. Like I was not able to take screenshots for my article. I was really pissed off about it. That's so rude. I yeah, know. if you need to, if you need screenshots, let me know. Sweet, I can hook you another up. Th- awesome. Another thing I really love about their whole dynamic is the fact that Maul's even feeding her information from what he feels in the Force and knows. And he's like this, like bad stuff's coming. Also why are you here i wanted obi-wan i was hoping for anakin and you know even the jedi have pointed out to her beforehand that they're like hmm, anakin's acting a little weird we don't have time to deal with it right now but like maybe you could talk to him like 
the fact that they feel that something's wrong, whether or not they even realize he's been groomed for the dark side. But she has this like information, this feeling, but she knows in her heart, she's like, he wouldn't give into that, though. And they don't have that conversation. They still don't have a conversation, really, before they never see each other again. The reunion was the last time they saw each other. Yeah. So the fact that, like, she realizes afterwards and can't even, like, tell the Jedi Council, like, hey, by the way, Darth Maul said this really weird shit to look out for Anakin and maybe something, like, apparently he's being groomed for the dark side. She doesn't even have time to tell them, nor would they even pay attention to her. No, she did That's have time thing. and she well, specifically she did, she chose, chose not, not to. to. Yeah. yeah I thought that was an interesting way to, like, the fact that she, like, you, you yeah. said it, Brittany, that mm-hmm. she trusted in his his light-sidedness that she believed so much, that he yeah. would never turn and so much had to work in palp like palpatine being the mastermind that he is for him to actually turn at the end of the day i keep saying it i'll say it every time we talk about star wars mace windu is the reason that anakin skywalker turned to the dark side not palpatine mace windu forced anakin's hand in revenge of the sith and yeah and the jedi council completely was complicit yeah. in it and um, that's why i love what they did with ahsoka and I think that unfortunately, had she had they not been so hypocritical and she wouldn't have been forced to leave, she would have been there to help him not yes, turn. 100%. Which is insane because watching the movies and not even knowing about her until they created her, you would have been like, no, there's no way he could have had a Padawan yeah. that would have changed his mind. And, and I love like, now that she's straight. integral to the Revenge of the Sith story, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I will never watch that movie and not think about everything exactly. that happens on this side. The, the, the last thing I want to say about this episode, uh, two things. One, like, Big props to Sam Witwer and Ashley Eckstein. I think they were in the same room recording their lines together. And it showed, uh, like you said, the dynamic between these two was just fantastic. And I got to talk about the Mandalore stuff because I think it ties into the series a little bit. Like how much trouble uh, politically Mandalore has always been in. And, uh, you know, their their inability to, to keep sides. And the fact that even though bo-katan is probably the better leader for the mandalorian people like there's that struggle like the people don't necessarily believe that and you know as we know in rebels mandalore ends up fighting for the empire for a very long time and when they do turn as we're going to find out more in season two of the mandalorian just like the great Mm -hmm. jedi purge there is a purge of mandalore and uh you know i think the seeds of that are a little sown in, in this episode so again great great way of tying everything in the star wars universe together right now um Let's move on to the penultimate episode, uh, Shattered, where the deed is done, Maul is in custody, they're on a capital ship heading back to Coruscant, the, the episode title says it all, uh, Ahsoka feels Anakin's turn to the dark side in the Force, and we have Palpatine execute orders, I'm like, getting teary out i'm not even kidding dude i'm literally um, like why do you think i'm looking away from my mic oh, execute <laughs> order 66 execute order 66 and rex who is one of ahsoka's best friends turns on her as do all of her clones who have been completely loyal to her and love and respect her and this is just uh i'm, I'm just gonna start here one of the things that really uh emotionally fucked me up during this episode watching it was uh you know i i have to give a, a quick shout out to uh the composer of of the clone wars kevin kiner yeah. uh because he made a decision even though he could have written his own thing for this specific part but when ahsoka immediately starts fighting the clones again it's the same music they use in revenge of the sith when order 66 yep. hits and that just fucked me up and i was like dude i cried oh. immediately as soon as i heard those notes yeah i was like this is it this is what i hate to watch um i haven't been a huge fan of the Clone Wars music throughout the series. I, I, I like Kevin Kiner, but I, I always thought it was just a little bit too synth. But his score for these final 12 episodes is some of the best music I've ever listened to. He pays respect to John Williams. He pays respect to uh, the composer, I can't remember the names, who did Blade Runner and mm-hmm. uh, Alien. There's just so much awesome sci-fi music in the, in the season. But like that moment when she has to fight them and there's that music from Revenge of the Sith is just such a powerful moment because you know what's happening to all the other Jedi as well. The, the buildup of tension leading up to this and then, you know, the, the whole thing, the scene when it's like, oh, yeah, you know, Commander Rex, you know, we have a briefing and such like that. And he's like, oh, Soka, do you want to attend? And she's like, no, nah, it's probably just more good news and all that. As soon as they said, like, there's a briefing to attend, I was like, that's it. That's that's when the order is mm-hmm. going to come in. And she's basically going to wa- either walk in right after it happens and so on and so forth. 
obviously Rex tries to fight it because at least that's what that's how I interpreted mm-hmm. it because he's kind of like yes. I think he said like you know fight him or fight find or fives like find fives because yeah, fives five. is one of the clones who figured out that he had a transponder in his head oh, okay mm-hmm. yeah that that whole scene was awesome and then you know the like it, it it was pretty emotional that the whole when all the clones are kind of storming the briefing room and she's you know, just blocking all their shots and she's like desperate trying to get away from them and she ends up you know cutting that hole in the ceiling and and then the whole episode is a pretty good cat and mouse where basically for a good chunk of it rex is hunting her and you know you feel bad because obviously like rex loves and respects her but he can't stop himself so but yeah i i loved the episode it that was a amazing episode so yeah order 66 is one of those things that every time i see the third movie like i just start crying immediately before it even happens i cry throughout the whole sequence of when the jedi are just betrayed and killed especially if i have to see ayla sakura get fucking oh, shot from behind when she doesn't even back. have a chance yeah. to turn around <sighs> And the thing is, even in those scenes, you sometimes see the clones hesitate at first and then pull and fire. So, like, I really enjoyed that. Okay, before I even get to this, we're going to go to the part. So, when Rex says that, like, hey, we're having a briefing, do you want to join? And he doesn't. I already knew, based on how the show was, like, hitting certain points of, like, oh, now they're going to, to you know, see Grievous or they're going to um, save the Chancellor. Things like that. I was like, oh, no, it's going to lead up to here. And I was trying to figure out, I was like, when is the point where he's going to turn to the dark side? And then when she like pauses and then like they use the audio from the third yes. movie. Yeah. It's like, Anakin, no. And he's just like, I need him. Yeah. Uh, uh, and he's just like, what have I done? Like I started bawling and I was just like, oh my God, she's on a ship full of these clones and they're going to betray her. <sighs> you can just feel it. And the, I love that they use the audio. I love that they use the same soundtrack from Order 66 because I was just, I was gone. I was completely just bawling my eyes out. And then when Rex does lift his guns and they're like shaking and he's just like, like thinking about shooting her, but moves slightly to the side to shoot the other clones, you know, like he misses her. Yeah. He definitely like had to force himself to miss her. And he's like, fine fives. Having seen the show earlier, you know, that fives is a clone that like literally started killing other clones because of an inhibitor chip in his head that they only found out because of that event. Yeah. And then they covered it up. So the fact that she looks into it, then finds it and then somehow finds a way to get the chip to turn off in his head like yeah. the moment where he like sits up and shoots the clones that are about to kill her that's it's such good voice acting but also such amazing animation because there's still hesitation when he kills them to save her well those are his and friends his hands are yeah shaking. yeah i know and his hands are shaking he killed his brothers to protect his sister yeah because rex and ahsoka even going back to the first episode i rewatched the first one just to like yeah i wanted to see how the characters like looked now having known the ending <laughs> and just like even their initial meeting like you're just like oh my god yeah and he's he says earlier in the season um i I gotta like wait (laughs) a second he says earlier in the season how hard it is to be the survivor so like that's just like their relationship and how they they proceed in the next episode together that's all that was echoing in my head the whole time how hard it is to be the survivor and let's let's move right into that because as we move into the the final episode of the season uh you know which is victory and death it's it's so damn sad because you know that rex will you know protect ahsoka at all costs and he'll kill his brothers because ahsoka won't but it is killing him Mm -hmm. inside because these are people that he has fought alongside for you know however many years the clone wars lasted and um knowing that he can't do anything about what's going on inside their heads was just so damn so damn sad and then you have Maul's, you know, arc where he doesn't do much, but he does enough, you know, with with the force, and you basically have hallway scene number two, um, <laughs> which is maybe oh. more brutal than the Rogue One hallway scene. He, <laughs> he decapitates straight up, efforts, decapitates. I, mean. some, yeah. I love that when she lets him out, she's literally he's like, "Well, you're you gonna give me a fighting chance?" And she's like, "I'm not rooting for you." Be, <laughs> yeah, she's like, "I'm not rooting for you. You can go be chaotic." What sort of character development was that for Ahsoka? Right? I loved it. She's um, like, "Nah, these lightsabers are mine. Good luck, bro." I, the, the one thing I'll say about this episode is that the episode, like the, the chase didn't do a lot for me. Like you, I knew we were getting to a point and the fact that, you know, they had to go through all these clones, like the action stuff was cool. And the moment in the hangar between Rex and Ahsoka where he's like, 
you may not want to kill them, but they want to kill you and they won't stop at mm -hmm. anything until you're dead. And that's so damn heartbreaking. Um, the, the episode really doesn't emotionally hit me until the, maybe like the fi final, like five minutes of the show when they're burying mm -hmm. the dead and we'll, we'll obviously talk about the, the last shot, but, uh, this was still, you know, fantastic. It was, it was also a good reveal because when he's basically, when Rex is kind of jumping on, you know, on Ahsoka and saying, you know, they're going to kill you, then they're like, and they'll, they'll do it because they obey orders or whatnot. And she kind of takes off his helmet and sees that he's like crying the whole time. Oh my God. Yes. Because <laughs> like he knows, because he knows that like, it's, it's kind of them or it's either her or them. And obviously it's killing him on the inside to, to do that. So Bro, I'm like crying right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Uh but the whole the whole thing obviously cuz the Je you know with Jesse I believe was the other clone who yes. has like the big mm -hmm. the big imperial tattoo on his head and stuff and such like that. And the I mean and Jesse was like the good counter to Rex where he's like you know you're in violation of the order Rex and blah 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 blah. And it was and like like i i loved the episode you know it was good to see obviously maul kind of mess shit up too i i enjoy i enjoyed maul's like use of the force and just like completely wrecking every single thing in his way yeah. whether it be clones or the ship itself yeah. uh <laughs> pure pure dark side you know just pure dark side energy just very cool visuals to watch mm -hmm. um i do love that they used the like tried to use the with jesse the whole but she's not a Jedi anymore. She's a civilian. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they just don't buy it. You know, he was trying to, to see if he can get by with the technicality and they're because they're programming. And the programming. So he was like, well, yeah. technically she's not. And they're just like, but you said this. Oh. Yeah. No, order six, order 66 applied to anyone who was a former force user. Period. Well, they even, yeah. well, they even said like we were given specific orders about Ahsoka. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, we, yeah. we know like, yeah. it's not even like that. She's a Jedi. And um, also, I will I will give a quick shout out, but the droids, like throughout the the two episodes, two or three episodes, like kind of squatting up and helping us. So they give their lives for her, essentially. Yeah, dude, that was yeah. that was amazing. Oh, yeah, one of them reminded me of Chopper. <laughs> a yeah. little bit. Yeah, <laughs> I was I was I was waiting for one of them to be Chopper. Yeah, right. Like that. And I'm like, oh nope, I guess that didn't happen. <laughs> Brittany, let's talk about let's talk about the final kind of the final two shots of the it's episode. my favorite, favorite part. Uh, Ahsoka and Rex have like narrowly, narrowly escaped these clones, find like the one working Y-wing in the hangar. Ahsoka is free falling, trying to get in there. And then, you know, we kind of, we cut to Ahsoka in a hood and she has, ugh, she's buried yeah. every single one of her friends, even though they were trying to kill her. She's, oh my God. Mm -hmm. Barry, yeah, they, they, they uh, yeah. used a makeshift shovel. Yeah. Too. Like she and Rex, the fact that they went through the ship, pulled out every single person they still could get the bodies of, gave them a proper burial, and put their helmets up that many of them had her painted face. Yeah. yeah. And then they stood there and they have a moment where they recognize, because like she said, like you're a good soldier and they are too. That's why she couldn't bring herself to kill them because that's not the, yeah. she doesn't want to be a soldier. She doesn't want to be a Jedi. He's bred, bred to be a soldier. That's different. That shot, like, this ending is bleak, but in a way that, like, rarely has happened in Star Wars. Even with Rogue One, you have a bleak ending, but there's hope. Yeah. This one, there's no hope. And there's no hope because Ahsoka and Rex don't know about Luke and Leia. You know? They only know what she's felt in the Force and what they've had to see in person, which is the clones turning against them. Yeah. So, like, that bleak ending was so important. I think because like it's the all is lost. This is what episode three should feel like. Yeah. This is yeah. what the majority of it feels like until you realize Luke and Leia are born and there's still a new hope that will happen. But the fact that, oh man, like, like I said, I called a lot of these things before they happened and it would just make me cry harder when I was right. But she holds the lightsabers out and you know, she's thinking of the last time she got to talk to Anakin and now she knows she was wrong. And she should have said something to him and she should have helped. And she knows the only way that she can make it out is by leaving them. Not yeah. only to possibly fake her own death, if that's even possible, if he can't sense it. But the fact that she's leaving the Jedi Order and everything that she was raised to believe, all her memories of him behind. Yeah. Like the hesitation in her hands and then she drops them with finality and just turns around like, 
oh my god it was it was an amazing moment and then mm-hmm. matt let's let's talk about you know i guess it's maybe a couple of years later vader has not or anakin honestly has not stopped searching for ahsoka and you know the planet's been snow laden now and this is not you know it's, it's vader in his suit and you have stormtroopers kind of surveying the area and you see him find the lightsaber and he activates it and uh i want to get your opinion on this matt uh it, to me it, to me that's not that's not darth vader in that moment that's anakin skywalker well it's it's one of those things where you can almost wish you can see what's going on behind, on his face behind the mask because you know is like what's his facial expression is he like is he up is he crying is he like thoughtful is he this is he that or is he like disappointed he doesn't get the chance to kill her and so on and so forth so it's good i liked that scene because it it kind of lets you wonder what's going on in vader's head but obviously you have no way of knowing because of the mask and all that stuff like that and i i love the music of of like a, of both the burial scene and also all that I and it 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 was a good way to wrap up this series like I it because it's it's that thing where it's like you know at that point you could make the argument that Anakin is fully gone because he believes Ahsoka is dead so that kind of connection to his former self it, it's now dead mm-hmm. it's gone so I didn't think about it that way that's a great point yeah, because yeah. now he is fully Darth Vader. Like, there's nothing left, and stuff like that. Now he's just he's gonna go continue the hunt for other Jedi. He's like, all right, she's dead. I I got other Jedi to go look for now. So I think this the fact the, the scene where he picks up the lightsaber and ignites it and turns it off is more sad than him yelling no in Episode Three. You know? Yes, one hundred percent. Padme is dead. Yeah. Like. That's dramatic, like, oh, no, what will I do? But, like, this, like, once again, saying so much was saying so little. He picks it up, like, with finality, turns it on, turns it off, and realizes that, like you said, he's lost that connection. The yeah. one that Yoda and them wanted him to have to possibly save him because they thought that he needed that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. oh, and the fact that he walks away and you see the reflection of him in the last remaining trooper's helmet which has her painted face on yes, it. Yes. Yeah. So it's like a reflection of who he was and he's walking and leaving it behind. Yeah. Like. <sighs> yeah. The animators. I can't. It's amazing. <laughs> um, the, the one thing I want to end on after just such a fantastic final season uh, is, you know, a, a quick question. Does, does this ending, this specific ending with these final four episodes give more meaning to the prequels? And, you know, do these four episodes possibly even make the prequels better? I want to agree 100% yes. I think if I rewatch the prequels, knowing the events of this show in my mind, and especially the ending, like, I know for a fact episode three is going to be infinitely better because yes. of this. Like, I'll never not be able to think about it. But even, like, knowing, you know, just more about the clones and, like, episode two and all these little things they've done to, like, kind of fix or retcon things in the prequels, especially in the case of Darth Maul, like it's just better. Yeah. You know that if he gets ch- chopped in half, you're like, cool, well, he's going to get a way better story arc now. Let's <laughs> <Yeah>. go. <laughs> yeah. Fuck Palpatine. Like, yeah. Uh, in my, in, so in my opinion, yes, I think it helps. Matt? Um, so that's a kind of a tough question for me to answer because the thing is, is that in a way, yes, but at the same time, though, it makes me angry at the prequel movies because when you mm-hmm. see how nuanced and how well that this that this story arc with Ahsoka and her relationship with Anakin was done, it makes me angry to think about the way the ham fisted way that George Lucas did it in the prequel movies. And it's one of those things where it's like, God damn it, George, why couldn't you have just stepped aside and like just been the guiding force behind the movies and just let people who were better at crafting stories and character moments take the movies from you and mm-hmm. the prequels could have been uh, incredible and that's the thing as i said that kind of makes me angry now yeah. looking back on like and the thing is is that i can't say that episode three is better now because of this because in the back of my mind i'm, I'm gonna be like a way better story is happening right now during this movie that's fair the Ahsoka that's true. yeah and all that and i'm sitting here watching anakin like and padme like like you know doing their like 
they're they're doe yeah, like while they're crying she's having a badass fight with maul like yeah. a few galaxies away yeah, yeah like and, and that's the and that's the thing and so yeah, i'm gonna tentatively say a little bit yes but overall no like it's 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 a it's a it's a crappy answer on my part i fully admit that but no no i i think no, you, you're not I think wrong. you bring up some great points um let's do the eip film real score out of five for the final season of clone clone wars and matt we'll start with you so i even though i i nitpicked here and there i still will give it a five out of five it it was excellent it it's one of those things where it basically and i i think i i mentioned this when we talked about the mandalorian is one could make the argument that maybe the future in star wars isn't these big grand movies it's in these tv shows that gives you time to flesh out these characters develop their relationships and all that other fun stuff now i could be totally wrong because taika watiti obviously is gonna yeah. be doing a star wars movie and heather already told me she's like i'm in <laughs> she's like not even a big star wars person so nice Brittany. um i'm gonna agree i give it a five out of five the show knew what it was and the things that it did and contributed to the star wars universe i will be thankful for it gave an ending that was so true to these characters, true to the events that happened in the films. Um, but ultimately, it was like super satisfying for me to watch. As sad as it was, and it made me cry, and I knew it was coming, I would watch it again just to be like, this is how Ahsoka's story... Yeah. Not that it ends, because it obviously continues, but like, this is how this story arc with her and Anakin ends. And yeah. like, this is what happens to all these clones that we came to know and love. So I think it was satisfying. It was beautifully just gorgeous animation yep lightsaber blurs and everything and yes. i agree with matt that i believe the future of star wars i'm glad the skywalker saga is over because i think the future definitely should be involved with other characters other plot lines and exploring the, the star wars universe more because what we saw even with clone wars had so much more depth to characters and even at familiar locations we saw more yeah the underbelly of coruscant you know, you have Mandalore, which we've have referenced so many times, but have rarely seen. So I think it is the, the future might be with TV series or just other forms of media. Yeah. Yes, there will be films. Yes, I will definitely watch them, but I'd like to see more in other forms. Um, You guys said it all. It's a five out of five for me as well. Just a, a fantastic season, even if I didn't quite like the, the four episode uh, Mar Martez, whatever, whatever, whoever they were, them, those people, uh, their arc. Uh, it's 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 just an amazing season of television. So five out of five. Um, we want to know what you thought. Um, does the series give more meaning meaning to the prequels? Does it make them better? Email us at permittedpod at gmail dot com, or you can comment on our episode section. Uh, you know, we're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, wherever you want. That's going to do it for this episode of Everything Is Permitted. For Matt, for Brittany, I'm Julian. Have a good night. You can find Everything is Permitted on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. Everything is Permitted is produced by Rob Migliaccio, Nikki Vizi, and Geneva Stein Shivers. Our executive producers are Michael Cox, Brittany Tomes and the Tomes family, and Julian Brown. <laughs>